I haven't really had a chance to show everyone the Neodan 8 or the, the K1830 and my current production line. I say current because I do want to do some more to it, although I'm extremely space limited at the moment. But I finally got over the hurdle of all the production work I had to do. Uh, at the point of getting rid of the Charm High and getting the Neodan 8, I estimated I was about three months behind where I wanted to be. And since getting the Neodan 8, I've managed to catch up and I've shipped all my orders. I've still got some, obviously, ongoing orders that keep coming in, but they're much smaller quantities. They're in batches of 100 and 200 at a time, rather than two or 3,000. So I thought it would be time to give you a look. Now, I've got all of my electric feeders turned off at the moment, because my hybrid feeders are still using those power supplies, external ones, which are extremely loud. But I thought I'd give you a quick look at some different aspects of the machine. Uh, maybe some things that you don't normally get to see. So let's get started. The machine is currently on and there's no noise at all from it. Any buzzing you might hear right now is actually from my server rack, from my 8 gigabit switches. So the machine itself, when it's just sitting here idly, you, if the lights weren't on, you wouldn't actually know the machine was on. <laughs> of course, the uh, interface on the screen. So just to go over some stuff that's inside, uh, some of you have seen this already, I might have seen it on Twitter, I have shown some video of the machine running. There are 66 eight millimeter feeder banks all up. There were 33 of them at the front, and there were 33 at the back. Now, obviously, a 12 millimeter feeder or a 16 or 24 will take up more space than a single eight millimeter. For instance, over here, I've got a 16 millimeter feeder with my antennas on them that takes two feeder positions. The same with the 12 millimeter feeder and the 24s. So the more large feeders you put on, the more feeder positions you lose for 8mm. But as you can see, I've got a full assortment. I'm missing two feeders at the back. Right now I've got more feeders coming. Unfortunately my hybrid feeders are dying and I'm now having to replace them. I'm going to continue buying just pneumatic feeders for the moment because some of you might also notice that I've got a mixture of electric and pneumatic on here. So one of the nice things of the Neodin 8 is that you can mix electric and pneumatic together at the same time. Now, the reliability of pneumatic on this machine is incredible. I'm running 0603 components at the back on pneumatic feeders where they've got the longest travel time to a board compared to over here, and I've got perfect pickup and placement reliability on 0603 on pneumatic feeders. The machine is very stable and very reliable. The conveyor over here is an automatic adjustable conveyor with vertical clamping to hold your PCB in place. Right now I have one of my play shields panels sitting in here. There are three play shields and I've just been calibrating the board for pickup and running. I'm going to run my first panel today. Now the actual conveyor itself is broken into three sections. You'll see a brake over here and a brake down there. So it's called track one, track two and track three. And the reason for that is you can have a PCB loaded over here while there's one sitting over here that's being pick and placed while there's one sitting over there waiting to go out onto the conveyor into the oven. So it allows you to preload. It also always makes sure that there's a next board ready to go and can start the next run on the next PCB while the exiting PCB goes through. You can also configure how they work in the software to support much longer boards. You can also see over here at the back that there is a tray area. It's also a discard area. Now, a lot of those components you're seeing discarded there are from either me loading reels in or experimenting with different pickups. And some of them are also from when I had my JST connectors and my stemmer connectors on tubes through the vibration feeder. I'm now buying all those components on reels and now coming off the feeders at the back, but I don't have a storage place to keep any of these JSTs and other components, so I just leave them there till I have a place to put them. I have started putting some of my loose components on 3D printed trays, as you can see over there, so that's flash. I have a lot of flash that I bought originally that came on tubes by accident, and again, I don't want to feed them from a vibration feeder. So I printed a tray over there and that's holding all of my tube-based flash. So when I run low on a reel, I can just move over to the tray. And over here is where my new tray that I'm currently printing for this particular board will sit. 
I am currently printing a tray for all of the components that I can't get on reels right now or that I, I don't have any feeder positions for. So it's a multi-component tray that's got QFNs on there, it's got a couple of SOT23s, it's got my SD card reader, speakers, my connector for the screens, a bunch of other stuff. And here it is printing. It's got uh, about an hour and ten minutes to go. So I'm having a few issues with my Mark III S after upgrading to firmware 393. I'm sorting through them, but there's definitely something wrong with the x-axis, the spacing. But uh, once this is printed, I'll be able to load it up with components and stick it on the pick and place machine. The machine itself has eight pickup heads. There is a camera on the left and a camera on the right, and both of those cameras can get used for both fiducial recognition on the boards when you're mounting a PCB to place components, as well as pickup locations on your components on the feeders for when you're tuning where it actually picks the components up from. There is also a front camera and a back camera down the end that is used for checking the components when it picks them up to make sure that the rotation is correct. Now the machine itself actually supports three different modes of using the up cameras. It can do what's called a flyby, which is where the heads will go flying over it and it takes eight very quick, very accurate photographs faster than you could think is possible. And then calibrates as the nozzles move onto the PCB area. You can put it into IC mode, which is where it'll stop and individually look at a particular IC, a QFN or a legged type IC, like a SOT package and it'll take a lot more time to make sure that it's got its orientation and precision perfect. And then you've got a large IC mode where it takes a photograph of a very large component, uh, something that's bigger than 12 or 15 millimeters across, and it does a different process on each of those different modes to determine how to do the correction on the nozzle before it places it. You can also tell the pickup heads what type of accuracy you want per component. So if you are placing a component that has a lot of forgiveness on the pads on the board, you can tell it to just do a fast accuracy. So it'll place it pretty accurately considering, but it doesn't have to be exactly dead center. You can also put it into higher accuracy mode where it spends more time after it stops to let the momentum stop before it then spins and places the component. So you get to pick and choose on a per part, per feeder basis, what precision of pickup, what speed you want it to move, what speed you want it to go down and up, what accuracy you want on the camera, and what accuracy you want on the placement. So there's a lot of fine tuning you can do on all of the different feeder positions. Plus the obvious things like what is your pickup height, what is your placement height, so some components you can tweak to push further into the paste if you want to, where some components you can make it sit a little bit higher up because some components like my buttons have a slightly domed button on it and if I push the button down too hard because of the dome it can make it shift left or right when I place it. So I put those buttons down a little bit lighter, a fraction higher, maybe 0.2 of a millimeter higher than I would place a different component. You get full control in the software over all of those settings. Yes, the system is belt driven. It is not using ball screw. I know there are a lot of people out there that will complain and say that you can't get precision out of a belt system. I disagree. <laughs> this Neodin 8 clearly shows that you can get absolute precision down to 0201 level at 100% speed, which I'm running it now, running up a belt system. And it's also extremely quiet and fast. So anyone that was looking at something like a Neodin 8 and were put off by the fact that it was running off a belt system, don't be put off at all. It's incredible. Here is the feed-in point for the conveyor. PCBs go in over here. Obviously I could put a conveyor in front of this and an auto feeder or a stenciling system. Right now my limiting issue is space. I don't have room. I could put a short conveyor in here and load up multiple boards if I wanted to. 
but I'm going to save that to work out if maybe I put an auto feeder in instead. But here is a panel of my play shield version 2 and PCBs just get fit in like this and as soon as it detects it, it takes it off my hands. It's now in the track 1 position ready to be loaded for mounting. Now that it's in place, if I was to start the run, which I won't actually do because there's no paste on the board, this is what it would look like. So the board would come in, there's a little stopper plunger that comes down, stops the board where I've set it up to stop and obviously it's ready sitting here to do fiducials which would be the next step. I can show you how that would work. I'm obviously not doing a mounting session, I'm simulating this. It's going to go grab two fiducials. I've actually got fiducials on the PCBs in this particular case. I've also got them on the edge rails but I'm not using those but you have the option of choosing whether each PCB in a panel has its own fiducials or whether you're using edge rails fiducials. Right now this is sitting looking at the very first component that it's going to place and I can actually cycle through now all of the different components and have a look at them on the screen. Make sure that it's going to place them in the correct spot and it's using the camera vision and you can see the flash on the camera each time it moves it takes a photograph, a high-res photo which I can have a look at so let's have a look at the screen now. I can't do a screen recording unfortunately. Well, I'm working on that with Neoden. So right now I just have to video the screen. The screen's got a little bit of glare on it, so I apologize in advance. I try to keep out of the way so you don't see my reflection in the monitor. But right now, as you can see, I've got a list of components here and I'm looking at each component and it's showing me a crosshair where the actual placement of that component is going to be. And I can click next and it's moving through each component like you just saw before and showing me the precision and you can see it's damn accurate these are all 0603 now if I had a problem with a particular component I can fix it here interactively with my mouse or I can use the spreadsheet view over here and type values in but this way I can have a look at all the different places and see where it's going to place everything. Right now I'm looking at my Play Shield version 2 board layout and these are all the components that I've got loaded. It's an area up top here where I can set up my fiducials right now as I mentioned I've got two mark positions they call it two fiducials and they're on the board and so the coordinates you see over here for the X and Y of each one is all relative to the very first component that's being placed component number one. Now that's an interesting thing. All the coordinates here are in millimeters and they're in no physical place in the machine. They're in a virtual place all based on the very first component, starting component. It's a quite clever system. It makes setting up edge rails a little bit harder because the edge rails are not relative to your first component if you got someone like JLC PCB to panelize the board for you. Right? If you panelize the board yourself you know exactly where you're placing your fiducials inside your CAD software but if you send it off to a CM like DLC PCB or PCB way and ask them to panelize it they will set up the panel and they'll put the fiducials where they want to put them and you don't get that coordinate data back and that coordinate data that comes back might act that fiducial position might actually be in a different place for different panels. I've also got a list of all my feeders. So these are all the feeders spots that I've got set up. You can see all my large feeders at the back. They're all every second spot because I lose two feeder positions. All my 0402s are up to here. I've got other components like my LDOs and my Shocky diodes and MOSFETs and stuff also down here. They're all nice small components. And then some 0603 here. 0603 here, pretty much all the way along. The occasional SOC 23 over there as well. You can also set up the tray positions, so that's what these ones are over here, that's where you're picking up from trays on the back. And if I just click on a particular component, let me actually pick a component that you'll be able to see the item. So I've got a 1 microfarad 0402 capacitor over here, which is in feeder position 13. So we've got a, a pickup position, we can tell what pickup height we're grabbing it, we're grabbing it at negative 2 millimeters what the placement height is, what the pickup angle is, a pickup delay and a place delay. These are in milliseconds. 
I can set the movement speed of the head and the down speed. I've got my vision, which is the fly calibration. I'm doing high speed calibration instead of the accuracy. It's a, in this case, it's, it's an electric hybrid, so it fires off pneumatic, so it's set to pneumatic. I can tell it which nozzles can pick up. All the first four nozzles on this are 0402 nozzles, and so any one of those four nozzles can pick up that component. And then I can also give it a length and a width and a height, and that also allows me to do a size analysis on it. So we can do a throw away if it picks up a component on its side, for instance. I haven't had the need to do any of that on my small components. I only do a size analysis on some of my larger components. Of course, I can do a test where it actually goes and does a, a test pickup. I can examine it and then I can throw it. We might actually do that right now. So I can click feed a test. Right, this component is not actually in this job, so it won't let me do it. Let's go grab a component that is in the job. I'll do my 10 microfarad 0603. Now I can do a test. I'm going to tell this to use nozzle 5. 5 and 6 are both 0603 nozzles. So nozzle 5, and I can step through it, or I can just tell it to do it. I'm going to step through it. So step the pick test. Do I want to open the feeder? Yes. Do I want to move the nozzle down? Yes. Do I want to move it up? Yes. Do I want to throw, or do I want to do something else? Well, I don't want to throw it. I'm now going to do a size measure. It moves it to the camera, it takes a photo, and as you can see, there it is. And it tells me accurately, according to the software, what its size is. 1.6 by 0.8. I can save that, assign it if I want to, or I can just say, okay, all good, I'm going to just throw the component, puts it on the tray, and it's done. I can now close that. So I can test picking up of components, no problem. Now, if I want to go through and set all of the pickup positions, I can just click pick up position edit, and it'll go through every single one of my components one at a time. So that looks cool. Next. I'm not using any of the 0402 on this job, so I don't have to align any of these, right? It's never going to use them, but it's as simple as me just going in, clicking a position, doing this on the side of the screen. Next. Next. And I can go through easily and set all of the positions. What I can also do is play around with the camera. So right now, there's only a brightness of 10. I can play around with the actual brightness. Maybe it's a dark component. Maybe it's a black tape with a dark component and it's harder to see. So I can play around with the brightness if I want to. I can do things like open and close the feeder. So if I scroll down to my JST connector, okay, I can tell it to open the feeder. Ah, oh, I've got my air turned off. <laughs> That's really funny. So, uh, I've got a note. Turn on compressor. I took it off to make the video. It's pneumatic, but I've got no air coming in. Okay, well that explains that. Anyway, from here I'd be able to open the feeder, which will open the tongue. I'll be able to pick the exact pickup position, and then I'll be able to close the feeder again and save all that data. I'll go out of that now. Save and exit. I can set up my nozzles. I can also set up my panelizing of the board. In this case, there's only three boards on there. And I can also set up at the start where I want it to stop in the track, what my PCB width and length is. So that's pretty much how the mounting software setup works. Once the board's been finished, then gets sent out the end, off onto the conveyor. In this case, the conveyor's not turned on. So there's the exit point for the machine. Here's the conveyor. Nothing. This is turned on right now. The oven's turned off. But I can turn the conveyor on. And there's a speed dial. So what you would see is it would bring the board through. I can slow it down or stop it if I want to to inspect. And then otherwise it'll go through here. The conveyor's not running on the oven, so it's going to stop now. Otherwise this would be spinning and it would take the board and put it through the oven. So that's how the conveyor system works. There's a bit of a, a ledge over here for me to work on if I need to pull the board off and do something. You might see bits of solder paste over here. My micro B and USB-C connectors I use on my boards 
have got peg legs, which means they have solder on them, and when you push the component in, it pushes the solder out the bottom of the board, which is fine when it goes into the oven, because it all gets sucked back in, but if you need to take the board off and put it down and look at it, like if I want to nudge a component, it leaves some solder residue. Just need to clean that off. Excuse the lighting. Obviously I've got super bright LED lights in here. This is not really designed to be filmed in, it's designed as a production environment. But that's an overview of the machine. If there's anything specific about the machine that you'd like to know, please drop a comment below and I will get those questions answered. If it justifies another video, I'm happy to do that. I'm super wrapped with the quality of the machine. When I first got it, I had to jump right into production. I didn't know how to use the machine very well. I didn't really know any of the intricacies of the machine. I spent almost no time in the setup screen looking at any of the setup values and any of the positional and calibration information. I just got the machine and it was calibrated well enough to start my Tiny Pico production and I started. Since finishing that, I've now spent a lot more time looking through the machine and calibrating it. I've done a calibration pass a couple of times and as you saw on the video before, is absolutely nailing the pickup positions and placement positions on the PCB when I'm cycling through them. I'm now able to run the machine at 100%, which I wasn't able to do before. Um, well, I could, but I'd get the occasional misplaced part or bad pickup. I'm now getting zero bad pickups, zero throws at 100% speed with 0402 components on my Tiny Pico, Tiny Pico USB-C and Feather S2, which is really exciting. And then on my Reflow Master and hopefully soon on my Play Shield, I'll have no issues because they're all 0603 and above. I've not yet tested 0201. I really want to, but right now I don't have a justifiable reason to move any of my current production boards into smaller components. None of them really need it. And all I'm going to do is introduce more cost and more time in setting it up just to have an 0201 component on the board. Maybe one of my future products will have 0201. I have plenty of reels of 0201 components sitting here waiting. All of the passive range caps and resistors. 66 feeders, positions is awesome. I wish I had 128, 132. I wish I had 400. Uh, the easy solution there is to buy another Neodin 8 and stick it in line and then I could do two different sets of pick and placing on the one board through the conveyor. Not only do I have no space for it, but that's just ridiculous. It's an option for down the line though. As I mentioned before, I'd like a way of automating the loading of the boards and Neodin do have auto loaders that you can put all of your pasted panels in and it'll sit there just feeding them in one at a time so I could just load up a whole stack of them. Another option is a fully automatic stencil printer so I can just have it automatically paste a board and then load it and then feed the next one in paste it. That also needs an auto loader so lots of money. I don't have room for it anyway. Thankfully if I had room for it I probably might have done something. But I'm looking forward to being able to expand this and not have to look at replacing this when I want to go bigger. Because my experience so far has always been about replacing the inadequate machine I currently have for a new machine. This is the first experience I've had where I don't have to replace anything. I can just keep adding, which is uh, fantastic. I did have to buy a new compressor. You might have seen on the initial shot the compressor tucked in at the back under the end of the oven. It's not exactly what I want. I would ideally would like a 150 litre screw compressor that sits outside that's completely silent. The uh, starting price on those in Australia anyway is about $7,000. You can get a little bit cheaper, but the biggest problem with them is they require three phase power. So I would also have to get three phase installed. Yeah, it's just ongoing costs. So what it means right now is my compressor has a duty cycle of about 30% which is not too bad. My previous compressor, which was smaller, had a duty cycle of 50%. I think 50% was a little bit too high. Unfortunately, this new one I've got, although it's a silenced compressor, is considerably louder than my original silenced compressor, but that was the only thing I could really get, and that still set me back about $1,000. So the machine does chew through a lot of air. It's using Venturi pumps on the nozzles, which means it's using pneumatic air for both sucking and pushing. All my hybrid feeders are pneumatic, so it's using pneumatics to fire those. 
Obviously, if I was using neodymium electric feeders that are fully electric, I could shut off the air for the feeders and not waste air on those. But right now, I'm using up air unnecessarily because I have no choice because of these particular feeders. So your mileage would vary depending on what type of feeders you're putting on the machine. But I'm totally confident in recommending pneumatic feeders on this machine. I don't know about 2mm pitch 0402 components on an 8mm feeder. I do have some here, pneumatic ones. I could try it but I don't have a need for that right now because I've got enough electric and electric hybrids but at some point in time these hybrids are going to continue failing and I'm going to have to replace them with either fully electric which are about three times the price of pneumatic. I do know someone else who has got an N8 that is doing 0402 components on pneumatic at 100% with no pickup or placement reliability issues so it can absolutely be done on this machine which is great. You can invest in a machine and not have to invest in all of the electric feeders at the start. So, sorry if this sounds like a sales pitch, it's not designed to be, but I know that there are stacks of people that have been watching and following my journey from original Charm High S1, last Charm High, to my Neodin 8 that are also in a position where they want to either upgrade their existing pick and place machine or they want to invest in a new first pick and place machine and I get a lot of questions via email and via my video comments and via Discord about the machine and its quality and its reliability and so that's what this kind of introduction to the machine is all about. Can I recommend the machine? Absolutely. Does it have some quirks? It does. Some of those are being addressed. Some of them, I don't know, I'm yet to hear about. Does it have some software bugs? Yep. Are they being fixed? Very fast. Neodeno, extremely responsive. It's incredible. And I've also been bombarding them with feature requests. Some of them are just quality of life improvements. Some of them are things that I would like. I don't know if other people would use. They seem pretty responsive on that as well. So yeah, from a customer experience point of view, from a support point of view, from a reliability point of view so far, 100% tick in every category. So yeah, as I said, anything else you wanna know about, let me know in the comments or somewhere and I'll do another video or I'll answer your questions directly. Please don't hit me up privately about more questions. Please do it publicly so other people can see the answers. Unless it's something personal to you, but if it's a general question about a particular feature, please do it, as I said, in the comments or on Discord. So when I answer, other people can see the answers as well and learn from your question. Okay, that's it, thanks very much. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're new here, or if you haven't subscribed to the channel but keep watching videos, please subscribe. It means a lot to me and to the channel. I think at least 60% of the people that watch my videos are not subscribed. So please subscribe. And to my patrons, you're awesome. Uh, maybe collectively we'll get another N8 on the line at some point in the future. That'd be awesome. Okay, thanks very much everyone. Bye.